COVID-19 has not just been spreading in large metropolitan areas, it is striking smaller communities like Albany, Georgia. Its poverty rate is above 30 percent. It's heavily African-American, and they are um, the hottest spot in Georgia for the coronavirus epidemic. I'm Matt Katz, and today on The Takeaway for March 31st, how the effects of COVID-19 are playing out in rural communities in the U.S. South. Also, why it took so long for the Olympics to be canceled, considering the global public health crisis. Then, how the global pandemic is affecting your relationship with food. I cook a lot more and use what I have so that I don't need to make trips to the store. And we round out our show with our latest in the Joking from a Distance series with comedian Demi Adijuibe. A lot of people are saying like, oh, the Shakespeare wrote King Lear while he was in a plague. And it's like, well, you don't have to <laughs> do that. It's fine to just take care of yourself. <laughs> But first, small cities and the spread of coronavirus. As COVID-19 continues to spread in the U.S., it's no longer just concentrated in coastal epicenters like New York and Washington State. Emerging hotspots are now popping up in the Midwest and the South, from large metros like Detroit to smaller communities like Clarksdale, Mississippi. Today, we're going to take a look at one place that's becoming an epicenter in the southeastern part of the country. Albany, Georgia, is a small city south of Atlanta with a rich civil rights history. Martin Luther King went there. There were mass marches. Churches played a big role in that movement. Freedom songs came out of there. Brad Schrade is an investigative reporter with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He says Albany is also one of the most impoverished cities in the state. Its poverty rate is above 30 percent. It's uh, heavily African-American. About 75 percent of the city is African-American. And they are um, right now the hottest spot in Georgia for the coronavirus epidemic. They've been hit very hard. There have been at least 250 confirmed cases of coronavirus in Doherty County, where Albany sits, with 23 confirmed deaths so far. And with a population of about 90,000, that means the county has one of the highest concentrations per capita of people known to be infected with COVID-19 in the entire U.S. I spoke with Brad Schrade along with Dr. Allison Chamberlain, an infectious disease epidemiologist at Emory University's Rawlins School of Public Health. Here's what Brad told me about how COVID-19 is spreading in Albany, Georgia. Health officials there trace the rapid spread to um, two funerals that occurred about a month ago now. One was on February 29th. The, the other one was about a week later. Both of them were handled by the same funeral home. And after the February 29th funeral, um, several family members got sick. The funeral itself was not linked to the virus. The person who died did not have coronavirus, uh-huh. but somebody at the funeral did. And Phoebe Putney, the ho- lone hospital in Albany, they said that their first 20 or so patients that came in with the virus were linked to those two funerals. In fact, tragically, the pastor who gave the eulogy at the February 29th funeral, he died of coronavirus about a week ago. Several family members uh, got very sick, and on Friday, one of them actually died from the virus. So these two funerals are, are sort of these, you know, mass gatherings that have you've seen in other parts of the country that somebody was infected, and they um, it just spreads from there. Oh, that is that is just so tragic. And you you had said that uh, most of the city is African American. Is that who's been most affected by this outbreak so far? Yes, uh, both of those funerals were the the funeral home that handled them were you know a historically black funeral home, and most of the people that attended those were African Americans. The large portion of the um, confirmed cases there have been and confirmed deaths have been African American. Now, the other thing about this is it's not just Albany. This is a rural area, and several counties surrounding Albany. Um, you know, people come into Albany. I mean, that's where they go to shop. That's so those counties have also been hit pretty hard relative to their populations. The mayor of Albany has placed some tight restrictions trying to get people to stay at home and and businesses are pretty much shut down there. 
And he has said, look, this is not an Albany problem. This is a southwest Georgia problem because, you know, if these other counties aren't abiding by the same restrictions, it doesn't do a lot of good. So they're really struggling to just get a handle on this. The hospital itself has been inundated. Their entire ICU wings have been full since the middle of last week. They're having to open up uh, sort of an adjunct ICU unit at a nearby facility that wasn't really being used a lot. The governor has sent down two or three um, medical teams from the National Guard to help out. They are really trying to get a handle on this. But as in most cases, this is just overwhelming their their health system. Dr. Chamberlain, are you able to give a sense of how the spread of the virus in rural Georgia compares to other hotspots like New York City? What's interesting is that sort of historically for you know public health preparedness efforts, and funding, we've focused a lot on the urban centers and making sure that we can plan for and address outbreaks like this, pandemics like this, in the settings that we think would be the most, um, you know, problematic in terms of high density populations, things like that, where, you know, we focused a lot of attention on those urban settings like New York, like Atlanta, like, you know, Chicago, LA. They've received additional funding, you know, over and above funding that other, you know, locales receive to, you know, ensure that they're up to speed and their systems can withstand something like this. And I think that, you know, this, the disease, like, as we, we know, doesn't discriminate in terms of who it infects. And I think that, What we're observing with Albany in particular is that this pandemic can really affect all localities, not just the urban centers, that it can affect the small towns like this just as badly, if not worse, especially given the underlying sort of baseline healthcare and public health infrastructure in these locales that that are just not as robust um, and not able to sort of take on the burden that can come when a lot of people get sick all at once. I also think it's sort of interesting to sort of note and think about how, you know, a small town operates. And when a situation like this arises where someone who, you know, is well-loved in the community passes away, those big life events get, you know, get a lot of participation from a close-knit community like someplace like Albany. And that's where we've seen that can have really bad ramifications in a time like this. And, you know, social distancing for a, you know, an urban city might feel a lot different from social distancing in a small setting where, you know, a, a quote, mass gathering um, for Albany is might be a funeral, whereas a mass gathering for some place like Atlanta might be a Super Bowl. Dr. Chamberlain, can you give us a sense of the state of public health in rural Georgia, Albany, and even statewide before the outbreak so we understand what might be playing out now? Uh, Georgia is divided into 18 health districts, and that has to do with the way that Georgia's population is um, sort of divided, that sort of the you know more centralized uh, population dense areas like Atlanta have health districts that might be, you know, just one county each. For instance, Fulton County is its own health district, and that's where the majority of the city of Atlanta is. But for a health district like in southwest Georgia, where Albany is, there are 14 counties within this health district. And there's limited staff that, you know, oversee a health district in this more rural area. And there's a lot of geography that these particular individuals who work in health departments have to kind of oversee and um, be in charge of promoting health programs like STD testing or, um, you know, community outreach regarding other sort of behavioral interventions, you know, diabetes care, things like that. They're stretched, um, especially in these more rural areas where, um, you know, they they can't touch everybody. They can't be, you know, as as close proximity to a lot of their constituents and the people that they're serving as readily as they can in a more, more urban area. Across the nation, we've seen sort of an atrophying of our public health system where we're just not as well funded as we once were to be able to provide the staff and the services that are needed, even on a daily basis. Brad, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp has so far resisted a shelter in place order, uh, the kind of order that we've seen elsewhere in the country. What has the state government done to address coronavirus in Albany and, and in rural Georgia overall? Well, that it's been left up to local officials largely to set the kind of community standards. I mean, the, the schools have been closed statewide, but the um, local officials set these uh, parameters of, you know, non-essential businesses, et cetera. The governor has sent down the National Guard. The state has sent in extra ventilators. You know, they're just trying to hold it together and, and you know, anticipating more cases coming in. Dr. Chamberlain, is, is that the best practice? Is a city-by-city city or county-by-county county approach 
effective during uh, a pandemic like this, or should it, things really be managed on the state level? We don't have a lot of precedent to go by um, with a right. situation like this. We've been through a lot of different, you know, um, global health emergencies and pandemics, but we've never reached this particular point in which we've had to really enact some of the social distancing elements that we've always sort of theoretically talked about um, having to implement. And so I think we're kind of learning as we we go here. Um, we have learned from other countries that the countries that have been able to implement this sort of more draconian social distancing measures early on in their phase of the pandemic really makes a difference. And we're a different country. Um, We have our sort of, uh, we, you know, our liberties that we like to maintain for as long as possible. And when you talk about very broad social distancing, um, you know, measures that impact our social liberties, we're getting, it gets really difficult. I think there's sort of different approaches that we've attempted to take, like we're talking about as far as, um, you know, having localities attempt to do it themselves. But when the localities have holes, when we're dealing sort of not with a bowl, but with a colander, it's really hard because so many people are interconnected. And these, you know, small town A that might, you know, you know, uh, introduce uh, shelter in place measures when they're next to another town that doesn't do the same thing and those people from that town are coming into the town that has the shelter in place, you can see where the, you know, the problems arise. And with a disease like this that's spreading so rapidly and that most people are susceptible to and we don't have a cure, that is a problem. And I think that yeah, one, it's kind of one week at a time, unfortunately, what we're dealing with, if we didn't put the very strict you know, measures in place at the highest levels in the beginning. For example, a, a week ago, uh, public officials in Albany were holding daily press briefings and, and public information meetings on Facebook Live. And they were there was a commission chairman from a neighboring county that came in to talk one of the days. People were having church services in these communities a week ago. They were still having large cookouts. And, and so f- public officials in southwest Georgia are struggling to try to communicate the seriousness of the virus and the outbreak and really trying to get the word out. But church is a huge deal down there. It's the part of the fabric of the community. And so they're they're really having to try to communicate as well as they can that of the seriousness of this situation. Dr. Chamberlain, before I let you go, should other rural communities around the country look to Albany and maybe take a more stringent approach when it comes to social distancing rules? I mean, is this one of the the lessons that other places should take from this whole experience in Georgia? Yes, I I believe so. I think they absolutely should. Behavioral change is hard. And that's what we're talking about is changing our behavior to stem this epidemic wherever it is happening. And I absolutely think that other small towns should look to places like Albany and say, this can happen here. What can I do as an elected official or a leader of my church or a leader of another sort of social organization to make sure that my, you know, members understand the gravity of what's going on and that, you know, being out and about right now can really be problematic because you cannot predict, you cannot know where everybody in your small town has been recently, who they've been in contact with, who the folks with, you know, that those folks have been in contact with. And it can be just as devastating in a small town as it it can be in a city. Dr. Allison Chamberlain is an infectious disease epidemiologist at Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health. And Brad Schrade is an investigative reporter with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Thanks to you both for joining us. Thank Thank you. you. The 2020 Summer Olympics, scheduled to take place in Tokyo, Japan, have been postponed due to the global coronavirus pandemic. This postponement may seem like an obvious move since all other major sporting events are also on hiatus, but the International Olympic Committee, or the IOC, was the last holdout, with their decision coming after countries like Canada and Australia publicly stated they would not be sending their athletes to participate in the Games. The IOC has been plagued by scandals and corruption over recent years, and our next guests have thoughts about what the IOC's handling of the coronavirus pandemic tells us about the organization's failures and its future. Jules Boykoff is a former professional soccer player. He writes about the Olympics, and he's a professor of politics and government at Pacific University in Oregon. And Amira Rose Davis is assistant professor of history and African-American studies at Penn State University and co-host of the feminist sports podcast, Burn It All Down. 
I asked Amira for her take on how the IOC handled the coronavirus outbreak as soon as it began. Basically, they just acted as slowly as as humanly possible. They were really insistent on still having the games, even as sports around the world were canceling, as things were shutting down and people were really kind of seeing what this pandemic was doing and the issues that could arise. The IOC was still really insistent on the games going on. And what's more, they were using a rhetoric to kind of foster this false sense of um, the power of the Olympics, um, alleging that the peace and solidarity, which is the kind of way they describe what they do um, of the Olympic Games were, were going to heal the world. One IOC official even said the flames of the Olympic torch will extinguish the virus. And so you could see them kind of hanging to this romantic notion of what they believe the Olympic Games to be or what they were selling the Olympic Games as and completely ignoring everybody's kind of cries over uh, the difficulty of actually staging the games this summer in July. Right, right. So then what what happened? Uh, They eventually did decide to postpone the games. Why? Well, in part because uh, not only did it just become very clear that this was not going to be resolved by July and having, um, even if Japan was kind of settling down with the pandemic, having uh, an international community dump into that area was not going to be sustainable. Um, And they were like refusing to even consider not having it with fans. So it was just going to be um, completely terrible. But on top of that, what really forced them into that is a lot of federations started very publicly saying, we're not going to send athletes. Um, The Canadian group was really vocal and first Australia joined them and they said it doesn't matter what you decide to do we're not putting our athletes um, in danger and then individual places in the United States like the swimmers were like we can't train we can't go to pools so you know qualifying rounds have been canceled like we cannot possibly do this and I think behind the scenes they started to feel some pressure from their sponsors which we know is really what makes the IOC do much of anything is when you follow the money. Getting to that, how is that how they decided on the new timing, Amira? How did they figure that all out in terms of making it next July, right? Next July 2021? Yeah, certainly. Cancellation was completely off the table. Um, that would have been a lot of money that they would have had let go. And and the longer they tried to push it, um, the more they risked a lot of that kind of bottom line. And so you saw that there was this desire to just kind of remount the games next year, even though on its face, while it seems fairly simple, it's very complicated to just postpone a game a year. And so just um, recently they announced that the games are slated to start on July 23rd of 2021 and run until August 8th of that same year. Um, And that was recently announced and that they hope will give them some time to move the entire infrastructure of the games to deal with venue conflicts, to deal with the ticket issues, and hopefully in their eyes just remount the same games next year at at the time. But I think there's a lot of logistics that are going to have to be worked out. And this is far from settled, even if they can, you know, proudly announce the fact that they have these dates scheduled now. Jules, what do you think about how the IOC handled this when it comes to the the athletes involved? Right. Well, first of all, postponement, as Amira said, would never have happened were it not for the bold leadership of athletes, sports organizations, and national Olympic committees like Canada, Australia, Germany, and Portugal. While the International Olympic Committee and Tokyo organizers were dithering, promising that the Games needed to go on, athletes stepped up into the leadership vacuum and they demanded that the games be postponed. I mean, someone had to step up and face epidemiological reality. And the fact that it was athletes leading the way, I thought was really impressive. You know, I view all this as tantamount to sort of a a radiologist injecting contrast dye into a body to more clearly see the organs and tissues and bones. Uh, Similarly, the way that the International Olympic Committee and the Tokyo organizers mishandled this postponement allows us to see in pretty sharp contrast the imperfections that plague the Olympic body. Uh, For example, the questionable nature of of the IOC's um, Athletes First slogan, as well as the ornamental relationships that the IOC holds with groups like the World Health Organization and the United Nations. And so what happened with Olympic boxing, I think, captures both of these dynamics at once and gives us a real window on what the International Olympic Committee 
truly thinks about athletes at the end of the day. So after the International Boxing Federation was absolutely ravaged by corruption, the International Olympic Committee took over managing its qualification events and then went on to allow a qualifier to take place in mid-March, despite the fact that it was obvious then that coronavirus was a serious problem. In fact, on March 11th, the World Health Organization declared coronavirus a pandemic. Three days later, on March 14th, the Olympic boxing qualifying events kicked off in London before being called off only a few days later. You know, at least six people have said that they had contracted COVID-19 while participating in that event. And, you know, that's unconscionable. This so-called leadership from the International Olympic Committee has put athletes in danger while at the same time ignoring the World Health Organization, a group the IOC supposedly works with closely. And you've seen frustration from athletes left and right. During this whole kerfuffle, Thomas Bach, the president of the International Olympic Committee, told athletes to just keep your eye on the prize and just keep training for the Olympics as if they were happening this summer. And athletes shot back where and, and how. I mean, here in the United States, the, both of the Olympic training centers were closed in Lake Placid and Colorado Springs, shutting off the opportunity for athletes to train. Same for many of the colleges and universities where athletes who are aspiring for the Olympics are training. And so I think this whole episode has really cast into doubt the International Olympic Committee's commitment to athletes first, as they'll often tell us. Jules, this is not the first uh, issue regarding the uh, IOC in recent history. Can you catch us up on the IOC's uh, troubles of late? Oh, sure. I mean, the International Olympic Committee is a privileged sliver of the global 1%. There's 100 members. 10 of them are dukes, barons, princesses. They didn't allow women into the group as members until 1981. You heard me right, 1981. I mean, wow. this is not a, a proto-feminist organization, and they have loads of internal problems. You know, for them, the postponement episode kind of conveniently deflects from deeper issues with the Olympics, such as overspending, the militarization of the public sphere that inevitably comes with the Olympics, displacement and gentrification of everyday working people. All this discussion around postponement has meant we are actually not talking about some of those ingrained features of the Olympics. You know, look at Tokyo, the fact that the Tokyo 2020 organizers are now suggesting that the games will cost an additional $2.7 billion because of the delay. It should be eye-popping to everyday working people in Japan who will pay the bill through their taxes. When Tokyo signed up for the Olympics, they agreed to be on the hook for all cost overruns. And the original budget for the Olympics was $7.3 billion. They'll tell you it's $12.6 billion, but an official government audit taking place in Japan says it's more like $28 billion. So costs have basically multiplied by four. So maybe wow. some of these issues that have been slid under the rug will now get a second airing now that we have another year before the Olympics are slated to commence. Amira, do you think there's a way to fix some of these structural issues with the IOC in advance of the postponed Olympics in 2021? Well, certainly. I mean, there's a lot of people on the ground who have a long history of pushing back against the IOC for the way that th there's ill effects of these Olympic Games in terms of housing and militarization costs, in terms of what the games leave behind when they pack up and leave and how that leaves local places really struggling. And so I think there's already structures in place that are existing to mount critique on the IOC, to mobilize people. And it also requires for, I think, all of us to really loosen our grip on the kind of emotional or romantic vision we have of what the Olympic Games are, it requires us to peel back the curtain and be attuned to the issues that Jules just so eloquently described, but also understand for the athletes, this has also disrupted them in serious ways and not the superstar athletes that we might be more familiar with, but Olympic hopefuls, aspiring athletes who are now forced into figuring out how they're going to survive financially for another year. A lot of athletes, particularly women athletes, um, depend on these Olympic years for the bulk of their incomes, for their opportunities to get endorsement deals, to build up the structures of women's athletics. Um, think about the women's national soccer team that was counting on having a one-two punch 
of the World Cup into Olympic year to really sustain and bolster them as they continue to fight for pay equity. Or think of individual athletes who, you know, like Gwen Berry, who um, made headlines for protesting at Pan American Games. You know, she told me in conversation, she's like, I'm, I'm taking it day by day. I guess I'll have to go back to work. And so understanding all the levels that go into the Olympic Games beyond just the feel good packages that we receive when we consume them every four years allows us to step into this opportunity and say, well, what can we be done? Well, one, we can continue to push individual federations to do right by their athletes to, you know, provide adequate health care to make sure they're overseeing stuff like sexual assault in the sport. Also continuing to push the IOC and not letting them ratchet up the budget, use this as a cover, keeping an eye on them beyond talks of postponement and really getting into the weeds of these discussions. Amira Rose Davis is the co-host of the Burn It All Down Feminist Sports Podcast and assistant professor of history at Penn State University. And Jules Boykoff is a former professional soccer player and the author of four books on the Olympics, most recently No Olympians and Power Games, a political history of the Olympics. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank Thank you. you. We reached out to the IOC for comments, and they directed us to recent statements on media conference calls by IOC President Thomas Bach. Readouts from those calls are linked at our website, thetakeaway.org. The coronavirus has forced us to change many aspects of our lives, including our relationship with food. Restaurants across the country are closed or only offering delivery. Grocery stores have lines around the block, and people are isolating themselves instead of eating with family and friends. If you're practicing social distancing, that could mean fewer trips to the supermarket and a stronger reliance on non-perishable food. In the last month, the sale of pantry staples like dried beans, rice, and pasta have skyrocketed, while the sale of fresh produce has fallen. Dan Pashman, host of the Sporkful Food Podcast, joined me to talk about how to make the best of your pantry staples, starting by explaining the safest ways to still buy and eat fresh produce at this moment. The danger with bringing home anything from the grocery store, whether it's fresh produce or dry goods, is if the virus is on that thing, if somebody walked by and coughed on it or breathed out particles and it got on the surface of that thing and then you touch it and then touch your eye or you pick it up and breathe it in, that's when it's a problem. Eating it, much less likely to cause you a problem. If you bring home fresh produce and wash your hands thoroughly and wash the produce thoroughly, you should be okay. Tell me about the non-produce foods, these these, uh, pantry staples. What makes an ingredient a good pantry staple? Well, really, I think the the classic definition is that it's something that is shelf stable. It doesn't need to be refrigerated and it can sit in, in, in a, an area of your house for a long time and not go bad. And that's why foods like rice, dried pasta, any kind of canned goods are especially good for that. Cans, jars, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about pantry staples, but really the way that I think think about it is sort of like any kind of food that won't go bad. So many foods all around the world uh, from all different cultures and cuisines have been created out of the necessity to find a way to make food last a long time without refrigeration. And that is why we have so many foods that use fermentation, pickling, smoking, drying, uh, and, and then in the last couple hundred years, canning and jarring and these technologies. And so, you know, all, all of these foods to me are kind of of a piece. These are all foods that are created out of necessity by human beings so that uh, to have food for a long time when you don't have a refrigerator. And some of the, this necessity to store food for a long period of time has yielded some creative foods through the centuries, I imagine. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, you know, I, I, it's very interesting to me that I think a lot of the foods that were created actually out of that were born out of very difficult times or to, to times uh, of uh, where there maybe wasn't enough food or weren't many options and people were really struggling have over time become hallmark comfort foods of so many different cultures. Uh, and so, you know, like look, look at a food like kimchi that is now, I mean, such a, a staple of Korean cooking that is a fermented food. I mean, I, there's a hundred million other options. That's just the one that pops into my head right now. But I, I think that, that right now a lot of us are feeling stressed about the things going on, yeah. understandably. Right. Right. And I think there's a natural desire to want to comfort yourself with food. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that to a point. And I certainly, and I spoke, speaking to other people, have found that I think a lot of people are sh- sort of like craving, craving the foods of their childhood, 
craving the foods that they grew up with. I, I, in our last big grocery store run, I went out and got the ingredients for cottage cheese pancakes, which was what we had every Tuesday night in my house growing up. And I have not, I made them for my kids once, like five years ago, and they were too yeah. little to really like them. And I, I'm going to try to make them again, but I'm like, out of nowhere, I want to eat cottage cheese pancakes. And so I think that it's normal for, for people to be gravitating towards the foods that they grew up with. And then also I would suspect that the foods that we end up eating during this stressful time are going to make an imprint on us. And you're going you're gonna to have an association between the foods you're eating right now. And, and if you eat it again, even in five or ten years, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I remember during that, the coronavirus time, this is what I ate. And you know, you'll have a story with it. When people are making their uh... – there are supermarket runs uh, right now. Are there any items, pantry staples, that you suggest people should be putting in their freezer or putting in the pantry? For the freezer, I would say frozen vegetables. You know, if, if you don't want fresh vegetables or they're not available for whatever reason, yes, canned, but also frozen if you have space in the freezer. I always have frozen spinach and frozen peas on hand all year round. It's a great way to add nutrition to something. Like sometimes I'll be cooking something and I'll be like, oh, wait, I just realized I started putting this meal together and there's no vegetables in it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like throw some frozen peas in there. Boom. Now you have vegetables. Throw some spinach in. But the other thing I, I will say in general as people are thinking about what to stock up on, I do want to note, I, I understand that we're all supposed to be minimizing the number of trips you make to the grocery store. So we should all be maybe buying a little bit more in each trip so we don't have to go so often. So we're minimizing right. our exposure to the outside world. That being said, all the indications we're getting from the, the larger you know, people who run America's food supply are that there's plenty of food in America. And there's no indication that we're going to be in a situation where you're not going to be able to go to the grocery store and get some food unless you yourself are sick and have nobody to take care of you. And so I just will, you know, just encouraging people like I, I get it. I think that when times are scary, there's a natural inclination to – to, ho to hoard because it makes you feel safe. Like, okay, I've got everything I need. But I think we right. all can maybe try to fight that urge a little bit and make sure we leave enough for other people because, you know, there are some people who are struggling to get what they need right now. I keep seeing pictures online of people baking bread and muffins and cupcakes. Uh, you know, it's, it's all over social media, people posting about how they're spending their time in isolation doing these labor and intensive food processes with their families and making like sourdough bread. Have you noticed that? And, and do, you, do you think people are turning to cooking and baking not only because they're like stuck inside the house, but also because it provides some, some solace during this time? Yeah, I, I have noticed that. And yes, I think that, that it certainly, I mean, first of all, if, if you're home with kids who are home from school, uh, cooking and baking is a great activity. I love cooking with my kids. And, uh, you know, it does require a certain amount of patience that, that I don't always have myself, but um, yeah. it's also a good activity to pass the time. So it, it has that benefit. But also, you know, I, I think that for a lot of people, cooking is a form of meditation. Even you get very focused on your task and and everything else seems to fade away for that period of time other than the task of making the thing you're making. I think that's very helpful during stressful times to at least have that hour or a couple of hours or however long where you're just focused on this project and that's all there is in the world in that moment and then at the end you get bread or whatever it is you made so that's a bonus right? i mean pu puzzles are great too but you can't eat puzzles <laughs> that's true that would be ill-advised yeah <laughs> dan pashman is the host of the sporkful food podcast dan thanks so much for joining us thanks matt be well take care and we asked you how social distancing is changing your relationship to food. This is Andrea Thomas, and I'm calling from Lancaster, Texas. Since I've been social distancing, I've not been going into the office, therefore not partaking of the snacks and donuts and even on some occasions alcohol that we have as part of our business. I'm actually at home cooking more and eating better. So in this case, COVID-19 has helped me drop about seven pounds in the two weeks that I've been social distancing. This is Joanne in Denver. I have my groceries delivered now. I wear gloves to go downstairs and get them. I cook a lot more and use what I have so that um, I don't need to make constant trips to the store. I'm really self-isolating. I'm a skinny old lady from Ohio, and I am working at home now, and I am too close to the refrigerator, and 
All I do is eat. We cook a lot at home anyway, but I find now we're cooking more and we're making even better food because every day feels like it should be special. So we make duck or we make steaks or we make really great chicken wings and it's a lot of fun. I'm Jennifer Jewett from Lancaster, South Carolina. Social distancing has affected me because I have a huge recipe collection and having so much time at home has enable me to go through my recipe collection and try some recipes that I wouldn't ordinarily try. I've made buca de beppo's tomato sauce for one thing and cooking various things with that. My name is Veronica Gledhill and I'm in Booth Wind, Pennsylvania, right outside Philadelphia. I'm trying to use things in my cabinet that I don't normally use, for instance, grits and vegetables that have been there for a while. I'm trying to really use up what I have. That way when I resupply, it's not panicking buying. It's the opposite of panic buying. I'm using what I have. This is Carl from Sacramento, and I miss fresh fruit and vegetables that I would normally be getting from a grocery store almost every day. I miss that. Hi, my name is Alice. And I'm taking social distancing very seriously because I'm in a high-risk category. Social distancing has forced me to use up what's in my fridge and my freezer and my pantry rather than going out to the store to buy things that I would rather eat. So I'm being a little more creative as to what I want to use up and in what order. As always, you can give us a call at 877-8MY-TAKE to share your thoughts on your relationship with food during the pandemic or really any story on the show. We're here to listen. For some of us, social distancing means adjusting to working from our bedrooms, living rooms, or kitchens. I myself am broadcasting from a closet in my bedroom. But for others, working from home was the norm long before officials told us to shelter in place. My name is Demia Dijewebe, and I'm a comedian and a former writer for The Good Place and The Late Late Show with James Corden. Prior to those writing gigs, Demi gained attention for some hilarious videos that he put together from home in his spare time. Here's one example. His take on what it might have sounded like if Will Smith had written a rap to go over the end credits of the movie Get Out. So my girlfriend took me to meet her mom and dad But deep in my stomach was this feeling I had I mean, yeah, their fancy crib was tight But something just wasn't right Oh, and did I mention they're white? Uh oh. They were polite, but it still made me squirm When her dad told me he wanted Obama for a third term And then I had a nightmare, it was whack I dreamt that I was sunken and my body got jacked I spoke with Demi for our series called Joking from a Distance Where we check in with comedians to ask how they're handling the pandemic Demi started off by explaining what inspired him to make song parodies like the one you just heard. I basically was a really big fan of the way that Will Smith had done those for a few movies through the 90s and thought it was a fun sort of writing thing. And then I think the first one I ever did was ages ago for The Winter Soldier. I used to do a series on Vine where I pretended that I was nominated for a bunch of Oscars and then did like fake nomination videos and one of them was uh, me saying yeah i was nominated for the original song i wrote for the winter soldier and then as i thought about it i kept thinking of lyrics for a song like that so i just wrote it and then i was like well this would be a fun tradition to do every year for the oscars and then just kept writing songs like that that's great does it take quite a while to write and record each song not as long as you'd think the lyrics come first and they're usually the the part that is the easiest. And then it's just about either figuring out what type of song I'm parodying and trying to do a sort of take on that or just sampling an existing song from whatever movie I'm doing and then tinkering with that until I get something that is original, but sort of harkens back to parts of that movie. And to be clear, you don't really make your income off these videos. This is this is for fun, basically. I make no money off of them whatsoever. <laughs> you're you're doing this for for creativity's sake, and and as someone who's been creative from your home, um, have you been able to keep doing these sorts of projects in recent weeks during this isolation period? I've been doing a lot of writing, uh, but I also feel like my life is not much different than it was before, aside from the mental stress just because I've been working from home and kind of out of work for a while now. So it's just been 
business as usual with me trying to be like, what else can I do that is helpful right now? And not just me holding down and being like, well, I'll figure out how to help myself. So it's a lot of writing. And then I think I'm going to try and do some creative projects as like a donation drive or some sort of just figure out how to keep doing the things I do, but in a way that can maybe fundraise for something. Do you have any specific ideas just yet? Yeah, I was going to do a thing where I basically do like those uh, end credit songs, but I would have it be like, if anyone donates $10 or more, tweet the receipt at me, and then I'll choose one of you at random to pick the next movie I do. And then I was going to mm-hmm. do like, oh, every time we pass X amount of money, I'll do another song so that if we get to like, I don't know, let's say $20,000 somehow, it's like, okay, I guess I'm doing 20 songs <laughs> through this. For, for those of us who might be a little bit bored out here and are looking for uh, creative outlets to do while social distancing, got any advice on making videos or music from home in terms of from a, from a technical standpoint or just like how you stay productive and how you, you see a project through to the end? Totally. I think musically, there's so many like free applications that you can use and don't necessarily need to know music. I know that uh, both... Moog and Korg release like free synthesizer apps for people to play with while this is all going on. And I've never had like any formal training in music or anything. And it's just a lot of tinkering. So I think the more that you experiment with those kind of things, the more you get confident in what you can do and you sort of feel like, okay, well, here's something. And then it's just a matter of building up that skill until you're just like, yeah, this is okay. I'll put it out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But, um, Aside from that, staying productive, I think, is very hard to do right now. And I wouldn't blame anyone who was just like, no, I'm not going to do it because I feel like that's that's not only the safer alternative, but it it feels like it's the less mentally stressful alternative. A lot of people are saying like, oh, uh, Shakespeare wrote King Lear while he was in a plague. And it's like, well, you don't have to (laughs) do that. It's fine to just take care of yourself. (laughs) But at the same time, if you do feel like you'd like to use this time to be productive, I would say the thing that always helps me be productive is feeling like I'm I'm accountable to someone else. So like telling someone that you're going to have X done by a certain point in time, even if that's just like tweeting it and then having it be like, well, now I have to be accountable because this is publicly out there. And if someone's like, hey, weren't you going to do that thing? It's weirdly embarrassing to be like, I didn't do it. I'm curious how this is all affecting comedy podcasts. You've co-hosted a couple of different podcasts in the past. Uh, do you think it'll be easy for podcasts to just switch to be recorded remotely? I imagine some already do some degree of remote recording, but others thrive on having that face-to-face interaction. Yeah, some definitely have done well with remote recording, but I've always never been a fan of remote recording because there's a lot of lag and latency and just a lot of sort of me being present and aware that I'm just sitting in my own room and listening to someone and like having to sort of like fake a chuckle if I can't, if it doesn't feel like it's the right conversation. But I think when people do podcasts with people that they're already friendly with and who they know over like distances like this, it's not too bad because then it just feels like a phone call. But it's like having a phone call with someone you've never met before is a situation where you just find yourself staring out of space and being like, is this who this person is? And you're not really as present as you should be for a comedy podcast. So it's definitely going to be hard. But I think that, I don't know, good editors will make it go a long way. And so will just people who find out how to do this correctly. Is there anything from your work, your repertoire that you can recommend to folks out there who might need a need a laugh or a smile at the moment? Yeah, sure. Um, People generally like my September videos on my YouTube channel. Uh, Every September 21st, I make a video of myself dancing to a remix of September by Earth, Wind and Fire. Uh, Aside from that, I have a lot of on my Instagram, I have a highlights that's just uh, dumb songs that the people really like. And a lot of it is just me picking like a Disney song and then being like this you can uh, read this Google search result right to the tune of this Disney song. It's a lot of dumb stuff that feels like what a brain would do like three weeks into quarantine. And yet it's something I did like (laughs) a year and a half ago because that's just how my brain always is. Amazing. You are ahead of your time. Demi Adjuribe is a comedian and former writer for The Good Place and The Late Late Show with James Corden. Thank you so much, Demi. Thank you for having me. You can find all of our conversations with comedians during the coronavirus crisis at thetakeaway.org slash joking.